good afternoon. Welcome to How to Get Started with Blended Learning. We are really delighted to have Catlin Tucker here with us today. Catlin is a Google certified teacher, best-selling author, international trainer, and frequent ed tech teacher who currently teaches in Sonoma County where she was named Teacher of the Year in 2010. Catlin's first book, Blended Learning in Grades 4 through 12, is a bestseller, and her second book, Creatively Teach the Common Core Literacy Standards with Technology, was published in 2015. She has a new book out, Blended Learning in Action, was published this September. You can also find Catlin writing a column called Techie Teacher in the ASPD's Educational Leadership, and she's super active on Twitter as well. So um, without any further ado, Catlin, let's switch it over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, as Christine said, my name is Catlin, and I'm really excited to be with you all today to talk about how to get started with blended learning. And for this particular webinar, we're going to start with three different models that are actually really conducive for teachers who are working in a traditional classroom setting. So we'll talk about whole group rotation, station rotation, and the flipped classroom. So for those of you who are on Twitter, I have my Twitter handle up there, at Catlin underscore Tucker. So if you have questions that you that kind of come up for you after the webinar today, that's a good way to get in touch with me. Um, for anybody watching the webinar after the fact, obviously a great way to kind of let me know if you have a question or you want access to a particular resource or you just have um, kind of thoughts you want to share. So we'll dive right in. Um, I always like to begin my presentations giving teachers a little bit of a window into the classroom where I've spent the vast majority of my teaching career. I taught in this classroom for 13 years and as you can see from the picture, it's definitely not a high-tech environment. In fact, my I work at a high school that serves 1,800 kids and there are only two functioning computer labs on the campus and then a couple mobile carts with devices. So we I'm definitely had to be creative when it comes to using technology with my students. And for the vast majority of the time that I have been kind of blending online pieces into our very traditional classroom, I've really been relying on student devices to get that done and then capitalizing on student connectivity outside the classroom. So I just love for teachers to kind of see that for for me, blended learning has been kind of this interesting challenge because of my access to technology. But I was definitely pushed to pursue something different, and that's really what drove me to blended learning, because the first seven years of my teaching career, I was really frustrated by all of these pain points that I felt in our profession. Teaching is not an easy job. Um, and for me, some of the, the kind of main pain points that drove me to kind of test out the waters with different teaching models was the feeling that I never had enough time. So I work in a 90 minute block period, which is more than a lot of teachers get. I know lots of teachers who are somehow managing to teach in 45 minutes or 50 minute periods, which I can't even imagine. But even in my 90 minute block period, I always felt like there just was not enough time for me to do all the things I really wanted to do with students. That was one of my biggest issues. Um, I have a really wide range of skill levels in a given class as well, and that can be really challenging because for a long time prior to using technology, I just didn't feel that I could meet all of the various needs in my class effectively. I always felt like I was leaving the kids who really need extra support out or not able to challenge the kids who really were ready for kind of some next level work. Obviously limited access to resources, not just technology, but resources in general. Um, as an English teacher, I have felt more on more than one occasion um, very frustrated with the amount of time that I spend outside of class grading and assessing student work, you know, whether it's early in the morning before my own young children wake up or it's on a weekend or an evening, I spend a ton of my own time assessing student writing and work. Uh, I definitely, at the beginning of my teaching career, was frustrated by a general lack of engagement, just kids who were not willing to take risks, engage in conversations with each other. And then 
and personally just feeling like I needed more support, um, whether it was just support on my campus or professional development to learn how to do things differently. Um, I didn't get a lot of training on how to use technology. So everything that I've learned that I've done with blended learning has, has primarily been self-taught. So it's been a really interesting journey, but I can definitely say that after transitioning from a very t traditional approach to teaching to a blended learning model that so many of these pain points that were challenging for me in the first half of my career have been mitigated and if they haven't entirely gone away like I can't ever escape the grading I still feel like that's something I'm working on um, but in terms of lack of engagement um, I really like creating more time for kids to engage in different activities and then meeting those different needs. Um, all of those have been really mitigated by my use of technology. So hopefully you'll kind of get a sense for how do you get started today? Where does it begin? What's the benefits and challenges of using some of these different models? And, and as we go through the webinar, you might feel like one or two models are the closest fit to what you're doing. And my advice right out the gate if you're just getting started with blended learning is to really take it one model at a time. Try the flip classroom or try station rotation and see how it goes and you know, know you're going to make a ton of mistakes and that's okay. And then you can kind of add additional models to your, um, your kind of teaching tool belt or what have you. So blended learning is really the combination of active engaged learning online with active engaged learning in the classroom, the blending of those. And the idea is that we want to give students control over these four elements of their learning, right? Time, place, pace, and path. So we want them to be able to not always control all four, obviously, but use different models to give them opportunities to control some of these um, aspects of their learning. Um, and that path piece is really important because that's where we start to think about how do we use technology to kind of put students on their own individual paths? How do we start to personalize their learning, their practice, the, the instruction using technology? So the first model we're gonna start with is whole group rotation. And for a traditional teacher at the secondary level, grades six through 12, the whole group rotation is a nice transitional uh, model to use. And the whole group rotation, if you look at um, the work being done by Michael Horn and the Christensen Institute, you won't see this name, this rotation. And what I wrote about in my most recent book is that you know, for a long time, we've been talking about lab rotation, where students would rotate between a classroom and a computer lab, um, and they might do that for a couple of reasons. One, because they don't have the technology in the classroom to keep kids there, but also there are some districts or blended learning schools where students will transition into a lab, and there's not actually a teacher in that lab. There might be some kind of a you know, a uh, aid in that room. And so for me, with the growth of kind of BYOD policies, the proliferation of one-to-one -one kind of initiatives at schools, even the increasing number of mobile carts, so Chromebook carts, iPad carts on a campus, I was arguing in the new book is whole group rotation is like a modern spin on lab rotation. Now that we have more schools that have ready access to technology in the classroom, we don't have the, the need necessarily to send students to another computer lab location to learn. Instead, they, a teacher can rotate students through online and offline activities in the same physical space. So students might start working, you know, together on kind of a hands-on project, or maybe they're researching something, um, or having a discussion, maybe the teacher is introducing some information, and then the class transitions into an online activity, a learning activity. And so it's kind of this idea of kind of rotating between online and offline activities using technology in the classroom without leaving the classroom. Now, one of the things I, I, I like to emphasize is like, why, why are we doing this, right? What is the purpose? I'm really big on why. I always explain the whys to my students for student buy-in. You want to explain the whys to teachers for teacher buy-in. So first of all, it allows teachers to easily weave in online learning into the traditional classroom setting. 
it creates opportunities where teachers, if every student is online, teachers can begin to think about how do I tailor the work they're doing online for specific groups of students. So whether you have them in different locations online or whether you have them in the same program and it's adaptive, so it's kind of meeting kids where they're at with their skill level in that moment, um, that's where using technology to kind of allow students to pace their learning and then kind of follow their own path becomes interesting. Um, giving them that control is really helpful. And then also when we get to station rotation, obviously with station rotation, students are moving around the room, uh, cycling through various stations. And with whole group rotation, it eliminates that need to move around the room. And for a lot of teachers, they are concerned about the amount of time that is spent in the actual act of rotating around the room, because we all know how slow kids can move when they want to. Um, so these are some of the, the benefits of whole group rotation. Now, I mentioned adaptive software, and adaptive software is software that is going to basically give students the or the learners the, the content or the practice based on how they are performing. And there's a couple different kinds of adaptive software. So sometimes adaptive software students will um, take an assessment and then the result of that assessment will feed them into the next kind of um, a section of what they're going to be doing. And that next section will be determined based on how they did on this particular assessment. Um, some adaptive software recalibrates the entire time as kids are working so that the next question they see is kind of based on how they answered the question before, which is very cool. So adaptive software can be pricey, but you know, lots of districts uh, do large district purchases so that teachers have um, access to them. So for example, I use vocabulary.com with my students and vocabulary.com does have a very limited limited free version for up to 50 kids. But what's cool about vocabulary.com is that as my students are practicing a vocabulary list and doing a range of activities that vocabulary.com creates, I do not create them, it adjusts to where the kids are at. So if a certain student is consistently missing a word or struggling, that word's gonna keep resurfacing. Um, obviously there, if you think about adaptive software in math, there's like that Redbird math where students are progressing through math and it's, it's, it's adjusting based on how they're performing on their practice, right? So adaptive software offers teachers opportunities to start to think about how do I challenge kids where they're at to make sure that what they're working on is appropriate for their skill level. Now, when we think about planning a whole group rotation, what's nice is, like I said, for secondary teachers, you're still creating that very linear um, agenda where you as a class, you and your class are going to kind of walk through a series of activities online and offline kind of blended together and depending on your the length of your period your teaching period you might be able to rotate through two activities you might be able to rotate through four it totally depends on how much time you have and how much time you anticipate each of these activities will take so for me i encourage teachers to think about one what are the skills you're targeting for this particular lesson? What are the objectives that you're hoping to kind of meet at the end of the day? Then I like to kind of sketch out or design the different activities we're gonna be going through. And the last step is really thinking about, okay, these are my objectives. These are the skills we're focusing on. These are the types of activities I'm interested in. Where does it make sense to add the technology? Where can adding technology give students kind of more control over the pace and the path of their learning? Um, and you know what? Sometimes when you're thinking about this, you might have thought, wow, I could use technology here. But when you start to think about how is technology adding to this particular piece, maybe it doesn't. And I'm such a big proponent for if it does not add to the lesson, if it does not improve the lesson in some way, we should not be using technology. So thinking about it in that progression can be helpful for a teacher who's kind of looking at kind of a, a lesson and figuring out how, how and where am I going to add the tech? What makes sense for the online 
sections. So I'm going to pull an example from my newest book, Blended Learning in Action. I have a few whole group rotation lessons I want to share because I know as a teacher, it's so helpful to actually see these things. Um, so that then as you know, even if I'm not a math person or I'm not a science person, I still get a sense of the flow of a whole group rotation. Because I think what we want to avoid as teachers, even if we're in a one-to-one, -one, we got technology coming out of our ears. We don't want to sit students in front of technology all day, every day. We want to change it up. I mean, for kids, particularly, you know, my teenagers, they, variety is the spice of life. They have to have different things they're working on or they get bored and a little bit restless. So here's an example of a math whole group rotation lesson. And it, it goes between kind of a, a teacher led introduction into an offline collaborative activity into an online personal practice with adaptive software. So I'm just gonna walk you through that. So in this lesson, and you'll see like numbers in parentheses, those are my time, kind of me timing out the, the lessons. So the first one is the introduction kind of explanation, explanation and modeling. So a teacher might introduce a concept, model, uh, you know, how to solve a particular problem, then they would trans, and this would be offline. And one of the things you need to think about as a teacher is if you're presenting a topic or you're presenting information or you're modeling something and students all have technology, there need to be norms in place to make sure that that technology does not distract students when they're not using it. And we'll talk more about that, that just strategies for how to do that. But it's something that you should be thinking about. So the introduction is teacher led. Then students break off into small groups for an offline learning section. Um, and we'll call this collaborative problem solving. So if a teacher just introduced a concept and modeled how to solve a problem, they might give groups the, a, a different problem and ask them to work together to solve that problem using a similar process. And then hopefully you might even be able to use technology in this moment, the offline, to allow them at the end of solving the problem, take a picture of what they did and post it online to a Padlet wall, which is just a Padlet wall is like a, a virtual post-it note board. So every group when they're done, they put their picture of like the process, how did they go through and solve the problem? Problem, what was their answer so that then all of these different groups can share what they did in this one location and then the um, teacher can pull up the Padlet wall and kind of walk through oh this group approached this problem this way and oh this group approached it this way can somebody from the group tell me why you guys chose to solve it this way um, so it just leads to some interesting dialogue about how you solve problems and how different um, kind of different process can lead to similar solutions. Um, and maybe it's an opportunity for the teacher to catch kind of mistakes and problems in the, in the solving of these kind of example problems that kids are working on. I would say you probably are going to leave somewhere in the neighborhood of like 20 minutes for that type of an activity. And then you would transition into the online learning section, which would be individual practice. And you could use anything from like a Redbird Math or maybe a Khan Academy or 10 Marks to allow students practice where their practice is going to be adjusted to where they're at skill wise. And then at the very bottom, it says exit ticket. And so one of the things that's nice about having technology in everybody's hand is there's a quick way to check in with them at the end of the period to see, you know, what did you learn today? What questions do you have? And then maybe even present them with another quick question to answer to kind of check uh, their comprehension. So that's an example of a lesson that a flow of a, a whole group rotation lesson. And um, in, in, in you could think about this in math or in history, you know, you could have students kind of watching a clip of a documentary and then maybe they get together in small groups and they're having a discussion about what they saw and maybe they hop online and do research together. So thinking about how are we, flow, how are we getting them to flow between these online and offline activities. Now, one of the things I see as a huge benefit to whole group rotation are those moments when every kid is on a device because 
in those moments, teachers actually have time to provide individual coaching, whether that's walking around the classroom as students work and sitting next to a student and talking about something that they're working on in the class or kind of coaching them on something they're struggling with or just checking in with kids. Those moments, those face-to-face -face kind of connections are so important. I also have all of these online kind of moments where I get to support students and coach them um, in their work. So we might go to a computer lab or every kid might have a Chromebook in the classroom. They might be working on a piece of writing and I'm actually jumping into their Google documents where they're writing to provide them with real time feedback. So they're in their document making edits, I'm in their document making edits. So again, it's that, that online coaching where yes, we're all on computers, but students see me actually in their documents, giving them feedback, um, providing them with tips, connecting them to resources. So using those online moments where kids are working to really get in there and work one-on-one -on -one with students, um, support students who are struggling, and maybe even kind of challenge those kids who are ready for that next level challenge. One of the things that's interesting to me that I'm always trying to blend are these kind of, some of the stuff we do offline and then moving them into the online environment. So because I don't, you know, always have technology for every student, we can't always do whole group. Um, I, I would say about 50% of the time we can do whole group because I have a Chromebook cart or everybody just that day has a device with them, um, or they most of the kids have a device and the rest of them can borrow my devices. Um, but I think it's important in the offline sections to allow students to practice specific skills. So right now you see students are working in their study sync print companion workbooks. And this is at the beginning of the year when I'm just teaching them how to annotate. How do you read a complex text and make sense of it? What, how do you highlight strategically? What kinds of notes do you want to make? And so there's some activities that make sense to do at least in the beginning of the year offline. Then as the year kind of progresses, we can take those skills or those kind of pen and paper annotation strategies and we can apply them to the online environment. So once students know how to strategically highlight on paper, how to make notes with, you know, in the margins of a text, then when we go online to complete a study sync kind of read write assignment, then those students are prepared to take those those paper active reading strategies and apply them to the online environment. So Study Sync has this digital library with tons of text and I can filter the different texts based on, you know, reading level. I can group students strategically. So I might have one group of students who are reading a particular text at this Lexile level. I might have another group of students reading another text at a different Lexile level. Um, they might have two separate assignments. So all of a sudden being able to go online to read opens up all of these possibilities for me as a teacher to begin to really select texts for particular students to challenge them where they're at, and then also get them thinking about how do we take strategies, pen and paper strategies, and think about applying them to the online space. So for me, there's a lot of kind of, I'm, uh, I try to think really strategically about what happens online, what happens offline, what happens offline at the beginning of the year that then will happen online later in the year. Now, there are definitely logistical concerns to um, the whole group. Now, one of them is technology infrastructure. So if you don't have access to a device for every student, that can make this a really challenging model to adopt. Um, because ideally, all students are offline, and then you're rotating them all are online. So every student should have a device in that scenario. If you don't you know, have that kind of technology in your classroom, are there mobile carts you can borrow? Is there a computer lab you can get into? And then it's more like that traditional lab rotation. I also think a lot of teachers are concerned about managing devices and minimizing distractions. So if every kid has a Chromebook on their desk, but you're trying to explain a concept or they're supposed to be collaborating offline, then having routines in place is really important. So for my students, when we are offline, they know they need to have their phone devices 
volume off screen down because I don't want all those notifications lighting up their individual devices. If they have Chromebooks, if everybody has a Chromebook, then I ask them to tilt their Chromebooks to a 45 degree angle anytime we're offline so they're not tempted to look at their screen or add another couple of things to the work that they're focused on. Um, cost of adaptive software is definitely an issue. You know, my, I, my school does not pay for me to have vocabulary.com. I could pay out of pocket, but as a single teacher, it's something like $35 a month, um, which is a little bit of an investment. Um, so sometimes if you find something great, that's an opportunity for you to talk to the people kind of who make those decisions for your district and your school and kind of make a case for a really great piece of software that you think could help to build students' individual skill levels. Um, and obviously timing and pacing is tricky because if students are completing a task uh, online or offline, you don't want to rush and you don't want to have too much extra time. So one of the things that I encourage teachers to do is to always build in next steps into a lesson. In. So if a group finishes early or a student finishes early, they know that there's these other things that they can be doing and they know where they can go to figure out what they can be working on. So I always have kind of like a next step section on my website so kids know exactly where they're going um, after the task I've assigned is done. The next model is the station rotation model, and this is exactly like the name, like it does exactly what the name suggests. Students rotate through a variety of stations. Um, to be a blended learning model, one of those stations needs to be an online station. Obviously, if you have tons of technology, um, we could you could design multiple stations that have technology. Although, when I'm working with teachers and districts, I always caution teachers, you know, don't, I wouldn't design all your stations with technology. Again, it's that idea of changing it up, variety, don't have kids doing any one thing for too long. So station rotation is particularly um, great for schools where you're you don't have access to technology for every student. You might have um, a handful of iPads or you might have a couple stationary computers and a lot of teachers assume, well, if I don't have one-to-one, -one, I can't do blended learning and that's just not accurate. So station rotation is a great model for those teachers who have kind of limited access to technology. I do think station rotation is a more natural extension of what we see at the elementary level. Elementary teachers do learning stations really well. So figuring out how to take learning stations and then adding technology to create a station rotation um, is not as big a leap for elementary teachers as it is for secondary teachers who are used to kind of those one size fits all teacher led uh, lessons. So just keep that in mind depending on whether you're elementary or secondary. All four of the pictures you're seeing on the screen are taken from the exact same moment in a station rotation. And so you'll see there's completely offline activity where kids are working at the board. You see there's a small group working with me. So I'm going through and doing individual or small group instruction. And then the other two stations involve technology. And students rotate through each of the stations in about a 20 minute interval. Because I have a 90 minute period, I can do four stations, 20 minutes a piece, and get through them all. But what I will say is there's no magic number or perfect number of stations. It depends on how many students you have in a class because maybe you only want to have five, six, seven students in a group and so that will dictate how many groups you have. Or maybe you only have time to plan three stations. So voila, there are three stations. It just It's totally up to you. Um, I get a lot of teachers who feel like, oh, Catlin, is this right? Am I doing it right? And if it's working for you, if it works for your students, then it's absolutely right. So um, you just have to make those calls. I also do four stations to be quite frank because my room, because the way it's set up, kind of lends itself with my really bulky furniture to four stations as opposed to like five or three. For me, some of the benefits of 
using station rotation are really this opportunity to create smaller learning communities within a larger class. Because one of my complaints since day one of teaching is that my class sizes are too big. I wish they were smaller so I could work more effectively with my students. So by breaking them up into station groups, all of a sudden you create these smaller groupings of students, these smaller learning communities where kids are more likely to ask questions. They're more likely to engage in activities because it's less scary because there's fewer of them, right? There's time for me as a teacher to work with small groups of kids. And just like I love working one-on-one -on -one with kids in whole group rotation, I love working with small groups of students in the station rotation. Um, for the first seven years of my teaching career, my lessons were lockstep, one size fits all. I really didn't have time to sit with a group of six, seven kids, explain a concept, field questions, give them feedback on work they were doing. And now I have that all the time and I have to say it's in those moments as a teacher where I experience the most kind of like aha kind of light bulbs going off for kids I don't know what the difference is for them but it's really much easier to connect with them in a small group setting and make sure they really understand the content um, as I said at the start of this rotation, it is a great way to maximize limited technology. So like I said, if you only have a handful of devices, you can have one online learning station and create this blended learning model, which is nice. I also love the focus that's it's very student centered. It encourages communication and collaboration. And because I'm not at the front of the room, like guiding an entire class through a lesson, the, the focus shifts from me being the center of the classroom to the students really being the center of the learning, which is always my goal. I want to take the attention off of me and I want to put it onto the students. So those are the things I'm trying to achieve with station rotation. Um, this is kind of a nice uh, overview pick of my room from the side angle so you can kind of see these little individual pockets of kids working right the four different groups these smaller communities within the larger class setting I also really love kind of like I said the, those moments when kids and I are sitting around so in this particular lesson we were reading a text in Study Sync's print companion, and I wanted to go through and, and just do kind of like a model close read for kids. So I read a section, and then I kind of talked them through what I would pick out, and then we went around and we took turns doing it. And then at the end, right in this moment, we were kind of discussing as a group, so how is what I, what I modeled for you kind of different from what happens in your head as you read. Um, what did you notice that, that you were like pulling out or that I was pulling out compared to what you were pulling out? And it was a really interesting moment where I got to think, kind of get a sense of where kids are at. What strategies are they using when they're reading? What bumps are they hitting where they need kind of support? And a lot of my students just don't know how to identify the most important pieces of information. So being able to model that was really helpful. And I had a student in the group this on this day just like have like kind of blurt out in the middle of my modeling like oh, I wish you had done this two readings ago Miss Tucker this is really helpful I, I didn't even know what to pull out when I was annotating so for me it's, it's, it's those moments that make this station rotation so valuable because I really get to connect with kids and I often, I almost always will lead a station, but I also design stations where students who are those really strong students, they're just, they get it, they get an opportunity to lead stations. So if I know I have a student who's just knocking it out of the park in this particular area, how can I allow that student to really shine and teach uh, like a small group lesson or explain a concept or model how they do something for their peers so that they get a chance to be challenged in a different way and then their peer group can learn from their expertise, which I love. I'm a big fan of kind of making the students the experts and putting them up in front of each other. So as you're designing a station rotation, and, and there's a lot of tips in my new book for how to do this, but kind of a general overview for designing a station rotation is that you wanna have that teacher-led station I know it is very tempting to think about designing stations that don't include you 
because we always feel like, well, if kids are working, then I can be at my desk and I can get through X, Y, or Z of, of the many things I have to do. But I have to say, leading those stations, like I said, is so rewarding. And if you don't lead a station and you think you're gonna be productive at your desk while all these kids do the rotation, you're in for a, an enormous surprise because students will, if they see you not leading a station, they will bombard you with questions um, just because it looks like you're trying to be productive. So you might as well just lead a teacher-led station. Then you have an online learning station, at least one, but you could have multiple. And the online learning station could be everything from, again, practice with adaptive, uh, adaptive software. It could be going online and research a topic and kind of crowdsourcing the information they're finding on a Padlet wall or on a Today's Meet back channel. Um, it could be getting them online to build some, you know, to create something. So the online learning can take lots of different forms. And then you have the offline stations. And I think the offline stations are great because they really challenge students to communicate, to listen, to work together. Um, I'm a big fan of putting students in groups and kind of giving them a task or a challenge to tackle together. So, and, and like I said, no magic number. It's whatever makes sense for what you're trying to accomplish that day. Now, one of the things that I use in trainings with teachers is I tell them that when I first started creating my station rotation lessons, I really struggled with the fact that I would design these stations and all of the stations that I designed built on the previous station. And the problem with that is that if students starts in the second station and it builds on station one, how are they supposed to do that if they haven't been to station one yet? So what I ended up kind of using in, in my own approach was this idea of going horizontal with your agenda. And what I mean by that is I used to plan my agenda in a very linear way. And so you have an example here. So <clears throat> I might go over, you know, do a mini lesson where I, I walk students through, here's how you format an argumentative paragraph. And then they might go and read and annotate an article. They might research an issue and experiment with writing a claim that could be the beginning of an argumentative paragraph. And then they might shift into a discussion about of mice and men. And so that's kind of a traditional lesson I might use. But if I go horizontal and kind of pull pull out the pieces of that lesson and turn each of those activities into a station, it might look like this. So obviously that mini lesson where the teacher, where I'm going over, here's how you format an argumentative paragraph, that would make sense as the teacher-led station. If students are reading and annotating an article, that would be a great opportunity to kind of differentiate practice and choose either different articles at different reading levels or use an online sort site where you could take an, uh, the same article written at multiple Lexile levels and have kids reading it. The research and write a claim could be really great as a study sync blast. So if I'm having them kind of research a topic like <clears throat> whether we should allow GMOs, you know, our food supply, um, then they might, you know, read through the blast background, re you know, do some research with the links that are already vetted and included with the blast, and then have them write a claim as their blast back out. So that could be a cool way to build in, that, that make that an online station. And then you could have a small group also discussing a chapter of reading and kind of going through and marking off the discussion questions that they cover as their group and kind of um, writing some highlights from their discussion in the margins of this paper that has the questions on it. So that's kind of how I would take a traditional lesson and build it out into this kind of the station rotation. And as I mentioned, the online station could, that one station could be a study sync blast. And I could, again, differentiate that by 
assigning the BLAST at different Lexile levels to different groups of students. So I would group students by reading level, and then one group would participate in the BLAST at the lowest Lexile, one group would participate at the medium Lexile, and one would participate in the high Lexile. And then what's nice about the study sync BLAST is it has kind of an information of the overview, it has all of the research links available, and then kids could use that, you know, the 140 character BLAST to articulate their claim, which is obviously connected to the argumentative paragraph, which is nice. So it's a great way online to kind of engage them and practice the skills that we're focusing on. Now, there's a range of ways to group kids, and I'll say 50% of the time, I group my students totally randomly, and I mix it up all the time. But if I am going to try to differentiate based on reading level or writing level, then I might group them by their skill level so that the strongest readers or the strongest writers are together and the readers who are going to need um, to read at a lower lexile are together or the lowest writers are together so they're really getting that additional scaffolding and support when they rotate through that teacher-led station. And I know teachers who will group kids by interest or learning preference, and sometimes I'll group them by what is your strength in a group dynamic? Are you a leader? Do you hang back? What would be the best complement for members of a group? And then usually when kids come in, I don't, I don't let them know how I'm grouping. Instead, I just put a little colored post-it note on their desks, and when we switch into, or we go from whole group into station rotation, then all of the pink post-its go together and start in one station together. All the blue post-its get together and, focus, and and start in one station together. And my, my reasoning for doing that is that I want the grouping strategy to be stealth. I don't want groups of students to perceive themselves as smart or not. Um, I want them to think it's kind of random, so I don't tell them exactly how I'm grouping them for an activity. Now, some logistical concerns, obviously you need to have some access to technology for station rotation, but you really can make a little technology go a long way with this particular model. Um, large class sizes are a challenge. I was leading a training where a teacher said, I think he said he had like 42 students in a class, and he said that's just, if I want to have six or seven kids in a in a station, that's just a ton of stations to plan. And I said, that is a very valid point. So one of the things I suggested is, imagine splitting your 42 kids in half, and then let's say you just designed three stations. This half of the room could rotate through these three stations over here. The other half of the room would rotate through the exact same content, the same stations, on this side of the room. So it looks like six stations, but it's really just content for three stations. So I really encourage teachers to think kind of outside the box when planning their station rotation. Um, I also warn teachers, like this is not the lesson you do when you're flying through the door 20, 10, 20 minutes before class. Station rotation definitely requires some lesson planning, some prep time, um, your classroom furniture and size and bulkiness, all of that can be kind of challenging. The grouping piece you always want to think about and plan for. And then using cues and using consistent cues so to really signal when and how kids are going to move around the classroom, whether it's a bell or a flipping of the lights or some sound that you're going to use to cue them at this time to move. So all those things are worth considering. And then the last blended learning model that works really well in kind of a traditional school setting um, that you might want to think about is the flipped classroom. And the flipped classroom is really well known. I think we can thank the Khan Academy for that. Um, the idea of the flipped classroom is really that the transfer of information that has classically happened in the classroom via lecture, so the teacher stands up, they tell the kids this information, that is shifted online. The benefit of shifting the, the information online is that students can pace their own learning. If it's a video, they can pause it, they can rewind it, they can watch it a couple of times. Um, and then the application 
you know, of that information, which has classically been assigned for homework, is moved into the classroom, where students have the subject area expert, the a whole group of peers with whom they can ask questions and work. So if you flip information and students watch it at home, hopefully they come to class ready to apply that information in the class setting. Um, because we know if we assign practice for homework, Kids don't always have the support at home to do that practice. Parents might not speak the language homework is coming home in. They might not have the content area expertise to assist their child. Um, and so for kids who struggle, sending practice home can be kind of setting them up to fail. So how do we support them if we bring it into the classroom? Then we can create opportunities for them to work together and learn from each other and to get the support from us, the subject area expert, um, as they're working. Working. Now, the goal of flipping the classroom is really to give control to students over the time, the place, and the pace of their learning, right? They're, they can decide when and where it's comfortable for them to watch this information. Then class time can be used to extend and apply. Um, teacher in that scenario is in the room to support kids who are struggling. And then because the information lives online, it can be revisited by the student, by parents trying to support the student. Um, it's accessible uh, after the fact. Whereas in a traditional model, you lecture, you give students information, and then it's up to them to have written it down or have notes. There's not an easy way to necessarily re-access that explanation. Now, when I'm coaching teachers on planning a flip lesson, I advise them to think about it in three parts. So the first part is really, how are we gonna create context for this flipped information? And that for me is step one. It happens in the classroom before kids have ever watched a video. It's an activity meant to pique interest, meant to get them kind of to drive inquiry, get them asking questions. It might be an activity where I'm trying to assess their prior knowledge on the topic. Then step two in my flipped classroom happens at home the majority of the time. And that is the step where you are, or where I'm transferring information, and then I'm engaging them around that information. So I don't just wanna flip the information and make it available online. I wanna flip it, but then I wanna use that online environment to get students asking questions about the information and kind of wrestling with concepts and trying to make sense of it before they come back to class. The third step in my flip lesson is apply and extend. So you got this information online, now I wanna create a student-centered activity where you're working with your peers to try to take that information and apply it. Um, in my book, I go through and talk about how I flip my vocabulary instruction, how I flip my writing instruction. And now last year, I just started flipping my grammar instruction. So I found this really a valuable strategy. Anytime I'm tempted to stand in front of the classroom and tell students, something, I ask myself, would this be better recorded as a video that they can pause, rewind, or watch a bunch of times if they need to? So one of the hurdles with the flipped classroom for sure for teachers is just the content. You know, creating your own content is a time-consuming proposition. And so I found it definitely worthwhile to create some of my own content, but then I also go online and find great content that's ready to use. So if the hurdle standing between you and trying the flip classroom is this idea that I don't want to create my own videos, or I don't have the technology to create my own videos or the software, then my suggestion would be, what's already out there that you can grab, right? Are there cool videos on you know, Khan Academy or on history.com or PBS where you can grab content? You know, For those of us using StudySync, I will often go into the StudySync library and just do a search of the Sync TV like skills videos so that I can see what, it, what video explanations of how to write a thesis statement are already out there so that I can use good stuff without having to kind of recreate the wheel. So my suggestion would be to get over that kind of hurdle, try the flip classroom with content that's already ready, see how it goes, see how your students respond to it. And then if it's worth your time to kind of go out and create some more of your own, you'll know kids like this model. 
Some logistical concerns for teachers are definitely one, access to technology outside of the classroom. Oh, you know, teachers don't want to disenfranchise students who don't have access. I would definitely suggest, if you're not doing it already, to send students home with a um, technology survey or have them fill out a technology survey in the classroom so you can really get a sense of who has access, who has challenges, how can you support those kids. Um, also, the, the, the challenge of well, I'd love to try this, but like, what if kids don't do their homework? The reality is there are some kids who just don't do their homework. And so the, you have to have systems in place to manage that. Whether it's, you know, giving students a device and asking them to watch the video before they transition into the student-centered application activity, or whether it is having them observe a group, you know, you just have to figure out how do you want to handle it. And then, like I said, that time required to create flipped content can be daunting. So grab those ready to use online resources, try them out and see if you like the model before you do a lot of kind of front loading in terms of time when you're, you know, in order to create content. So if you are interested, excited about blended learning, you want to know more, I have two books on the topic. Blended learning in grades four through 12 is really focused on teacher, like how do I create a safe space online? How do I engage students in, in discussions and communication online? How do I weave that back into the classroom? And then my most recent book, which was just published at the end of last month, is Blended Learning in Action, where it goes through all of the various kind of concerns and, and things we need to think about when we're shifting to a blended learning model, whether, and it's it kind of from the teacher and the leader perspective, and it goes through and talks about each of the various models and how do you get that done in a traditional classroom or in a classroom? So those are out there for you in case you want more information. Um, and like I said, if you're on Twitter, you have questions that come up after today, you can send me a, a note and let me know you want more resources or more explanation on something. Or if you're not on Twitter, but you um, can get to my website, CatlinTucker.com, you can also post questions and comments there and I'll see them. So I know Christine has been kind of monitoring the Q&A, so I'll turn it over to her and she'll let me know kind of what questions have been asked so I can answer those before we say goodbye today. Hey, Catlin, one of the questions we heard from the audience was around what size classes you currently teach. Oh, okay. Um, well, last year, uh, my teaching position changed this year, so this year is very different. Um, my 14 years before this year, my class sizes were anywhere between 27 and 32, just depended on the year. Um, this year, I'm actually piloting a new program where I am co-teaching with another teacher, and we have three classes that we teach together. So I am co-teaching English, science, and a technology social media course, and all of those classes are actually taught in concert around big topics. So this year, my class is 60 students. So I have 60 students for a four and a half hour window where we're going through these three different subject areas. So we're, that we're bringing together these three different subject areas. So it's definitely been a big adjustment moving from 30 to 60, but I'm, you know, it's not like I'm handling 60 on my own. I have another teacher and two adjoining rooms, so it doesn't feel quite as overwhelming as that might sound. Another question we have is, what changes have you made to your assessments when using blended or flipped classroom models? That's a great question. So I have found myself using much more of the formative assessment in, you know, as I've transitioned to blended learning because I assess my students much more frequently to see where they're at, what they're getting, and where I want them to go next. Because if what I really want to do is try to get them on their own personal path and try to challenge them where they're at, I have to be constantly checking in with them. But I 
I will say I use technology a lot to help me assess more accurately. So for example, my students will um, do like a diagnostic test on No Red Ink, which is a grammar practice website. And so they'll do a diagnostic and I'll get all these statistics and stats about where they're at in terms of their skill level in relation to specific skills or specific content areas. And then I can kind of shuttle them into practice for areas they're struggling with. And I can put different kids into different kind of paths of practice based on how they, how I, how they were assessed by the program. So I'm definitely doing more informal assessment. I'm, you know, when I'm in their Google documents and I'm using technology as much as possible to give me data about where kids are at, whether it's vocabulary or writing or reading level or, you know, grammar to try to figure out where, where do they need to go next on this path? Do they need to go back and do more practice? Do they need another explanation? Are they ready to go ahead and kind of move to the next level? So for me, assessment is, you know, an, an almost daily kind of part of my my life as a teacher trying to meet the needs of kids. But like I said, it's not me taking home stacks of paper and grading them and handing them back. It's a very different kind of flow. I hope. Okay, so going back to the discussion around flipped learning, um, we had a couple questions around uh, technology at home. And so I know you addressed this a little bit, but can you just speak again to the idea of how you would provide alternates for those students who can't access technology at, lo at home through that flip model? Absolutely. So there are a couple different things that you can do. And one of them um, actually combines two of the models we talked about today. So if I, if I had my kids complete a technology survey and I had a substantial number of students who did not have reliable access to internet or a computer outside of classroom, what I, what I would do and what I actually do quite frequently is I take station rotation and the flipped classroom and I marry those two models. So if I have four stations or five stations in a class, then one of those stations would be the flipped station where students watch the video, take notes, and then the next station would be the application and extension station. So that moves the flipped classroom into the actual classroom. Now, in doing that, you lose kind of two of the factors that I identified, which are time and place, because obviously students don't have control over the time and place if you're asking them to watch this video in the classroom. But they still can, um, they still can control the pace of their learning. So they can pause the video, they can look up a word online, they're not sure what it means. And so I still think there's definite benefits to that. In the book, though, I, I have a graphic that shows kind of how you have to think about your station rotation progression if you're going to marry station rotation and the flip classroom. Because like I, the, the challenge I hit when I first started designing station rotation is you can't have students start at the apply station before they've seen the flipped content. I mean, unless you have just a rock star group of kids who you want to challenge and see what they can do before the flipped station. But most of the time, if I'm going to do an in-class flip, I will add an additional station to the ones that I norm, like to the number I normally would. So instead of four stations, I'd have five. But on the first rotation, there would be nobody in the fifth station. It would be empty. And the fourth station would be the flipped video. So there wouldn't be anybody in the application station. And then during the second rotation, the kids who saw the video would then fill in that, that group that was empty during the first rotation. Um, and so you just have to think about it strategically. I also know teachers who have burned CDs and checked them out like their books. And if you're going to be reusing your video content every year, then using that as a strategy to potentially check out a video lecture to kids who don't have a device at home might be another strategy to get that done. Or even putting videos, you know, on a flash drive so that kids can take them if they have a computer but they don't have internet access. So I think the first place to start is figure out what is your student's access outside of class? 
then think about could you imagine using the, the in-class flip approach within a station rotation? And if not, does that kind of burning some videos to a CD uh, or a DVD make sense for your kids kind of to check out? Awesome. We only have a couple minutes left, and there's one more question that's interesting that I want to make sure we hit. Um, what, how do parents feel about the flipped classroom model, and have you had any um, great experiences or challenges with that on the parent front? Yeah, um, I had a really funny experience. So um, when I first started the flipped classroom, this is years ago, I, if, you know, my kids are watching videos from the beginning of the year, and we didn't have back to school night until God, we didn't do back to school night until October or something crazy. And I'm up there doing my song and dance at back to school night. And at, as you know, people are shaking my hand, they're leaving, some parents hang out and they want to talk. One of the women said, it is so great to finally put a face to your voice because I hear your voice all over my house all the time. And I like froze because I was thinking, what is this woman talking about? But she, her daughter had been watching my flip videos like all the time. And it was the first time she had ever like had experience with that. Um, um, so that was a funny kind of moment where I was like, oh, parents are seeing or hearing me at least um, on these videos. Um, so then the, what that kind of sparked for me was a decision to flip my back to school night. So the next year, I actually did a video where it was like me on camera introducing myself and my teaching philosophy. And then I went into a virtual tour of our online website and some of the online spaces we were going to be. And I email blasted all my parents before back to school night. And I said, this is a flipped classroom approach. And it was really cool because I think for them, a lot of parents can't get to back to school night. They, you know, or they have three kids on a school campus, they can't get to every teacher. And I think it really, for them, highlighted the value of this model and the benefit. Um, I also know that so many of my parents love that my website has all of my videos. So if their kids are struggling, they actually can go online and hear my explanation of like how to do a piece of writing or what a word, a vocabulary word means, and, and they can support their kids. So for me, all the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive and I survey my students um, every single semester, what's working for you, what's don't, what, what isn't working for you, and they, overwhelmingly love the flip classroom. It's one of the things they think is the most effective. Excellent. Well, we're at about an hour now. I just want to take a moment to thank you so much for your time today. It's been really interesting, and I hope it's invaluable for our audience. Um, so um, why don't you go ahead and close this up, and then we'll, we'll finish up. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining me today. It was great. Um, and again, don't hesitate to reach out if you want more information on anything or you have a question.